Hi, it's Emily from the Broken Science Initiative. I want to talk a bit about induction. So at BSI, we think the first major break in science happened when Karl Popper denied induction and declared that outcomes were only scientific if they were falsifiable. We think that was wrong and we think it has led to the replication crisis. So induction is something really important to understand. Let's start with a simple example. Imagine that you are a detective and you're trying to solve a series of burglaries in a neighborhood. You notice that there's a pattern. The burglaries are always occurring on the weekend and the burglar always enters through the window. So using induction, you might conclude that the burglar is likely to strike again on a weekend and enter through a window. Now this conclusion is not certain, but it's reasonable and it's generalized based on the available ev evidence. So now let's contrast this with deduction, which is the opposite of induction. Deduction is a method of reasoning from one or more general premises to reach a logical certain conclusion. So suppose that the detectives use deduction and start with a general premise, meaning one that is widely known, but that isn't really specific to any of the observations that we've made in this case. So something like the burglar always strikes when homeowners are away, which is a general assumption. So now they would apply that to this case and the detectives might deduce that a particular homeowner that's gonna be away this weekend is likely the next target for this burglar. So in this example, the detective's use of deduction leads them to a flawed conclusion because their premises is too general and it doesn't consider any of the details of these burglaries in particular. So this illustrates one of the potential pitfalls of deduction and highlights the importance of using induction to make accurate generalizations based on specific information and observations. So try to remember, induction is a method of reasoning that involves drawing general conclusions from specific observations or cases. It is the opposite of deduction, which involves drawing specific conclusions from general principles or premises. I hope that makes sense, that they're inverse of each other. The concept of induction also has been debated for like a really long time. So if we go back even to like the ancient Greeks, philosophers like Aristotle were among the first to discuss induction as a method of reasoning. Now Aristotle viewed induction as a process of reasoning from particular to general, and he considered it necessary for any method of acquiring knowledge. So really important to Aristotle. And we go to the 18th century and we have the Scottish philosopher, David Hume, who raised a significant challenge to the concept of induction known as the problem of induction. Now Hume argued that when we cannot justify inductive reasoning because we're using past experiences and there's no logical connection between past and future events. So you might say that the sun has risen every day in the past, for example, but that does not logically guarantee that the sun is gonna to rise tomorrow. In the mid 20th century, the philosopher Karl Popper proposed a different view of induction based a lot on Hume's arguments. And he argued that scientific theories cannot be proven true by induction because there's always the possibility that the future observations will contradict the theory. So this idea of like, just because we've seen the sun rise every day, doesn't mean that we can be certain that it will rise tomorrow. This is an interesting idea. I mean, it's you can see why this caught on with a lot of people that you have to be able to deny something in order to know that it's true. But that's absolutely not the path forward. You need to be able to know at least with some certainty, not absolute certainty, there is no absolute certainty, but with some certainty, which is why we like probability theory, because it gives you the probability, the likelihood that the sun is gonna come up tomorrow. It's not 100%, but it's also not zero. And it's gotta be somewhere in between. So Popper argued basically that scientific theories should be formulated in a way that make them falsifiable, that you can prove them wrong, and that they should be tested and attempted. Everything should be around this idea of trying to disprove them. Now, David Stove, who's an Australian philosopher that we love at the Broken Science Initiative, was a huge critic of Popper's philosophy on science. And Stove argued that the falsifiability criteria for these scientific theories was seriously flawed. So according to Popper, a theory is scientific 
if and only if it can be falsified by some possible observation. Stove points out that that's sort of, there's a lot of nonsensical ideas that can be falsified and many scientific ideas that cannot be easily falsified. So an example of this is all swans are white can be falsified by observing a black swan, but that does not make this a scientific theory. On the other hand, many historical or statistical claims which are certainly part of scientific knowledge, cannot be directly falsified. So Stove's main contribution in some ways was his defense of induction. And he argued that inductive reasoning is indeed rational and that Hume's problem with induction is based kind of on a mistake. So according to Stove, he would say that Hume wrongly assumed that there is no logical connection between observed and unobserved instances. And Stove argued that this is a misunderstanding of how induction works. In practice, scientists and ordinary people like you and me use inductive reasoning all the time and it works remarkably well. Another way of thinking about induction comes from the Bayesian perspective, which we talk a lot about at Broken Science too, obviously. So Bayesian probability theory provides a mathematical framework for updating our beliefs about how the world works in light of new evidence. And in this framework, induction is not a logical problem, but it's a problem of reasoning under the idea of uncertainty. So E.T. Jaynes was a big proponent of Bayesian perspective, and he argued that the Bayesian probability theory provides a rational and consistent method for updating our beliefs in light of new evidence. According to Jaynes, Bayesian reason reasoning is a natural way to approach the problems of induction because it incorporates this notion of prior knowledge and new evidence in order to make a prediction about future or future events. And we have another video where I talk a little bit about Bayesian versus frequentist approach to this. So if this is, you wanna dive a little deeper into that, check out that video. So in the Bayesian framework, Induction is a process of updating our beliefs about the world based on evidence, so observations, things we have. And we start with a prior probability that represents our initial belief about the world before we've collected any new evidence. Then we collect new evidence and we update these beliefs using Bayes' theorem. This updated probability is called the posterior probability. So for example, Suppose that we're trying to predict whether it will rain tomorrow. We start with a prior probability of rain based on our knowledge of the local climate, of the current season, of the things around us, right? Then we collect new evidence, such as the current weather conditions and weather forecasts. We use this new evidence to update our prior probability. And in doing that, we obtain a posterior probability of rain. We use this new evidence to update our prior probability. And that's how we obtain a posterior probability of rain. This posterior probability represents our updated belief about the likelihood of rain tomorrow based on all of the evidence that we've compiled. So while the concept of induction has faced some criticism from philosophers like Hume and Popper, it kind of remains a fundamental method of reasoning in science. And David Stove's defense of induction and the Bayesian perspectives, we think provides an alternative way of thinking of induction that addresses some of the challenges that have been raised by its critics. And I'll just add that I think the way that we all process information, right? And the way that we look at our world and we decide which way we're gonna go home when we're in the car and there's a lot of traffic, let's say as an, an example. Like you're gonna think a lot about like, okay, well, when I go this way, I have to take these back roads and I might go, I might be traveling faster, but it's a longer distance. Like those are all computations that we're making all the time. And they take our prior knowledge and then they apply it to this notion of making a prediction about the future. What's gonna be the best outcome? So the idea of denying this kind of thought process is, I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's so naturally intuitive to the way that our brains work and how we think. And to deny that and say, you just have to falsify things is like moving backwards. So 
One of the examples that I gave before in the other video was talking about friendship and sort of the inductive nature of picking friends and predicting how that friendship will go and revising that all the time. So that's a big component of the Bayes way of thinking is that you're constantly revising. It's not yes or no. It's let's see how we can refine this and get more and more accurate outcome in terms of the end probability. And so if you were to deny induction and rely just on falsification for friendship, you'd spend your whole time trying to find things that were wrong with the friend and not look at the things that were right about the friend. And that's like a huge oversimplification. But if you start to think of this in terms of how am I using my knowledge, right? Everything you've ever learned, experiences you've had, this is why you get wiser as you get older, probably, right? That's all inductive. So for us to scientifically deny this, means we're focused on something else. We're focused on outcomes that are really binary, yes or no. And if you wanna be critical, we have to maintain skepticism in science. We're not denying that, but we're saying the process of progress is far more inductive than it is based on denying things that are not true. I hope this makes some sense, thanks.